Now I'll move to Minnesota. To Bedote, the place where two rivers meet, a great, a very intense and meaningful spiritual significance for the Dakota people. To the European settlers, the confluence of the rivers was a perfect site for trade and military occupation. It is where Fort Snelling was built and where officers from the South were allowed to bring their slaves, even though Minnesota was technically free territory. The US government's Indian agent at the fort was Lawrence Talaferro, who himself owned a significant number of slaves and also engaged in slave trading at the fort. The fort's namesake, Colonel Josiah Snelling, was also a slaveholder. His name remains on the fort as well as on a street that is four blocks from my home. Historians know of at least four enslaved people who were brought to Fort Snelling who later sued for their freedom between 1830 and 1860. The most famous of those cases is that of Dredd and Harriet Scott. I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. So the Supreme Court Justice, many of you probably know the Dred Scott case, it infamously declared that Africans in the Americas were distinctly different from and inferior to not only white settlers, but also indigenous peoples, particularly in the relationship to land and rights. As historian Katrina Phillips summarized, Taney wrote that enslaved Africans were considered as a subordinate and inferior class of beings who had no rights or privileges. Taney also compared enslaved people to the American Indians, arguing that the situation of enslaved people was altogether unlike that of the Indian race. Even though he considered native nations uncivilized, they were yet a free and independent people governed by their own laws on their own land." End quote. The second place in Minnesota I'd like to think about is South Minneapolis, which has become very famous this summer because Officer Derek Chauvin and his colleagues murdered George Floyd there in broad daylight, sparking the most recent iteration of the long abolitionist movement. Officer Chauvin is infamous for his callous murder of a black man, but he is also tied to the death of an indigenous man, Leroy Martinez from Alaska. So this to me brings up both his own personal depravity in these murders, but also the longer historical alliances between black power activists and the American Indian movement against police brutality in Minneapolis. Indeed, one of the most interesting stories to emerge from the uprising was the mobilization of the Little Earth safety patrols. Early in the uprising, these folks from an uh, urban reservation caught white teens who had traveled from Wisconsin 100 miles to wild out. They wanted to use the uprising as cover to steal from stores. And so uh, Indian country today wrote this about the incident. Quote, the white teens who were from Eau Claire 100 miles east were seen taking alcohol and groceries from stores. The AIM members recovered the merchandise, took the team's names and numbers, and called their mothers to tell them to come pick them up from Minnesota. So why these stories? Because for me, they testify to the importance of thinking through place, power, and belonging in ways that resurface stories that have been buried. The intertwined histories of indigenous and black people in the Midwest. So I want to meditate on why it's been so natural so thoughtless for us to think about police violence and gentrification for that matter, in terms of black and white geographies of cities without reflecting on the fact that we coexist on indigenous land. So what does this all have to do with Hallie Q. Brown? Well, the reason I began with these stories is to emphasize that we exist on storied land. I'm inspired by La Paperson's concept of ghetto land pedagogy, where stories of land, both in terms of time and space, are central to decolonizing understandings of historical and contemporary conflicts in the US. La Paperson draws on Goman's concept of storied land as an antidote to settler colonial vanishing. I can do another share here. <clears throat> 
Quoting La Paperson, storied land offers a method of land education by extending critical cartography spatial analysis with a temporal analysis implied by indigenous struggle and black resistance. The when of land, not just the where of place toward a decolonizing cartography as a method for land education. The erasure of Hallie Q. Brown from dominant public memory is possible in large part because of settler erasures of stories from land, particularly the stories of Black and Indigenous people from the lands of the Midwest. To tell the story of how Hallie Q. Brown has been left out of textbooks, left off the lists of major women's suffrage activists, left off the lists of anti-lynching and other civil rights leaders, is to understand how settler colonialism disrupts the stories of land. It is not just the physical displacement of people, destruction of homes and sacred sites. It is also a disruption of the cultural richness, sharing and social connections. It degrades the capacity of a community to remember its stories, to preserve them, to pass them down. Our relation to place shapes the stories we have ready access to. When we think about just place names, the streets, buildings, and parks we travel through, the physical and psychic distance that happens when children are separated from elders who could pass down stories, the physical loss of gathering places, formal and informal, where people can tell, overhear, and appreciate stories, the trauma that causes people to avoid talking about certain places because of the pain they experienced when they were removed. All of those things are part of ghetto colonialism. So today I present the story of the Hallie Q. Brown Community Center Archive and its namesake as part of a larger story of settler colonialism. So first I situate the state's displacement of the Rondo neighborhood, an African-American neighborhood where Hallie Q. Brown Center once stood as an incident of ghetto colonialism. Second, I will describe a series of resilient conversations I co-facilitated at the Hallie Q. Brown Center between elders who grew up in Rondo and black college students who did not grow up in Rondo, but had heard at least a little bit about the displacement. And those resilient conversations have led us to begin creating a school curriculum for fourth and fifth graders to remember these stories. So in 1956, the Minnesota Department of Transportation, in partnership with the federal government, began construction of Interstate 94, ripping out the heart of St. Paul's African American community known as Rondo. More than 500 families were moved from their homes. Scores of businesses, civic organizations, and other places were destroyed. No one received adequate compensation from the state. Though many in the community struggled to resist this forced displacement, it was futile. Between 1916 and 2010, over 2,500 urban renewal projects in the United States displaced 750,000 people. 75% of those displaced were people of color. And public health research is clear on the impacts of forced displacement like this. Higher levels of stress, decreased access to healthcare and social support networks, family separation, and increased exposure to violence. This research illuminates the economic scope and sociocultural devastation of a specific mode of settler violence that La Paperson terms ghetto colonialism, a specialization of settler colonialism in North America. The term ghetto colonialism draws from Tuck and Yang's discussion of the colonial triad, the white European settler, the indigenous person, and the enslaved African. The settler, whose power lies in shaping the land into his wealth, the indigenous inhabitant, whose claim to land must be extinguished, and the chattel slave, who, who must be kept landless. For settlers seeking new frontiers, the ghetto serves as an interior frontier to be laid waste in order to renew. It is a murderable non-place, always available for raising and resettlement. So ghetto colonialism doesn't just snatch up black people's property. It also disrupts sacred political and cultural spaces they have built. 
just as settler colonialism tries to erase the stories of indigenous people's claims to land, the urban renewal cycles of displacement of black people disrupt cultural memory and practices. And these displacements reinforce the myths of white dominance and presumption of white ownership and better stewardship of land and natural resources, whether in the rural or urban environment. So our lives and our stories are shaped in large part in Minnesota by this ghetto colonialism, even if that term is never used in our schools or by families to describe their history of forced displacement or conceptualize it as part of intergenerational trauma. Spatial displacement causes root shock, psychological, social, physical, and spiritual harm to the group removed from their home places. Places can be defined as mazeways. Following Wallace, the mazeway is the sum of the shared lifeways in a community, a collective construct that depends on shared history of life in a given place. Rupture of the mazeway leads to paralysis of the, of the social group that arises from loss of guidance for next steps that the mazeway used to provide. So those next steps in African American communities like Rondo were imagined and discussed at key social sites that were now are now removed. And one of those sites was the Halley Q. Brown Center. And, and though the center owned its own property, they actually had a mortgage burning ceremony in the 1940s. And though the center building was not actually physically within the zone of highway construction, the state still used eminent domain to seize the property and make them abandon it as part of the larger renewal scheme. So a new center has been built. It was built in the 1970s in partnership with the city and it's co-located with other service complexes. However, it is interesting to note that the old location has never been redeveloped. It's just concrete, it's empty. So I see the Halle Q. Brown Center and the archive as part of a field uh, that's shaped by ghetto colonialism. It is located within an inter- and transgenerational site of trauma of serial racial displacements and indigenous displacement. As a surviving institution of the Rondo community, the Halley Q. Brown Center began the archive project a few years ago to preserve and share community knowledge and generate renewed networks between people and place. In the archive, we aim to provide current and future generations with meaningful historical narratives, community connections, and knowledge that provides the foundations for the next steps against racism and decolonization. If we believe that place is storied, then stories must be shared to live on, even if people have been displaced from the storied lands. And before I move to the next slide, I just want to tell you what these two maps are. Uh, the map that is hand drawn is a map by a Dakota artist that uses Dakota place names to map out the territory of the Twin Cities with the, the, the Mississippi River uh, running between. And then the other map of Central St. Paul, uh, it's probably hard for you all to see this, but uh, there are areas marked out, including Rondo, that are considered slum areas. And all the slum areas actually overlap with areas where there are Black, Mexican American, or Jewish American people in St. Paul in the 1930s and 40s. So those are two maps that I want you to remember. So stories reveal how place calls to humans and the more than human to recognize each other and their entanglements on shared land. One of the harms of ghetto colonialism is the loss of stories due to the loss of relationships on shared land. After black displacement, white settlers have dictated the story of the place within their own museums, schools, and libraries. And this has largely been within the framework of progress against slums. The term urban renewal itself suggests that decay preceded it, thus nothing and no one of value was there. And this approach, this sensibility 
of decay is evidenced in the strained relationships between the Minnesota Historical Society and Black Rondo residents. So uh, in the wake of I-94 and in the sort of rediscovery of uh, the need to actually preserve some Black history, the Minnesota Historical Society has periodically um, brought things into its collection, including a lot of items from the Halle Q. Brown Center. And it's highly contested how that happened because we don't have really good records. So I want to tell you a story about Gloria Presley Massey, who is pictured there in the orange shirt. I witnessed her trauma of the memories of removal and erasure of her childhood home when we interviewed her a couple of years ago for the first time. She had just gone to the Minnesota Historical Society website to search for some pictures of Rondo. And she saw that a picture that included herself, she and some of her friends as young children, was unnamed, unlabeled. They were just black children. And she also saw that the picture could be purchased without her knowledge or permission that images of her friends, her parents and grandparents play and reproducible and saleable without any identifying information, just the generic black children or Negro people with no stories to give context, that really hurt her. To riff on Catherine McKittrick's work on the archives, the settlers digital archive becomes an index of racial displacement, not a representation of black life. So as we've built up the community archive, we have been hosting community conversations and events. And like I said, and I'll talk about a little bit at the end, we're started, starting to build a curriculum as well to foster black life connections and rejuvenation of storied space. And so one of these events that I'm going to talk about at length is the 1968, uh, 2018 Resilient Conversations that we co-hosted with the Minnesota Historical Society. They were looking for ways, and they have been looking for ways to try to repair their relationship with the Rondo community. And so they came to the Halle Q. Brown Center and asked us to plan with their funding, so they gave us money, good on them, um, to plan an event that would be different and that would really bring uh, people together across different groups. So I was asked to put this together and I was inspired to think about how to do an intergenerational conversation. And I was inspired by a interesting statistic. So in the United States, it's clear the health disparities. Um, African Americans are suffer greater in terms of um, health outcomes than white Americans in almost every category you can think of. But what's interesting is this little asterisk I found when I was looking at some public health research is that when African Americans make it to age 75, their health outcomes actually get better for the rest of their life as elders than white Americans. And that intrigued me because it suggests they've lived a different kind of life, um, that something has infused them with a little extra resilience. And where did that come from? So I looked at some other public health research and I found some really cool work comparing uh, the US and Europe that shows that a sense of solidarity and community connection can be healing even if you've suffered significant trauma. Connecting and reflecting with people, maintaining social connections and a belief in shared accomplishments, values, and struggle is one of the hallmarks of resistance. Sharing stories is one of the best ways to connect with people. And so in the spirit of intergenerational healing, I designed three conversations that we called the Resilient Conversations. And the first two were just for Black diaspora uh, college students at the U to meet with elders like Gloria Massey at the Halle Q. Brown Center. And so we used a, a restorative circle format to share experiences and memories comparing 1968 to 2018, engaging around the question, how do we make it through tough political times with our hearts and minds intact? So these events were meant to connect a new generation of younger Black people who were removed from direct experience of the traumatic 
uh, destruction of Rondo to people who had experienced it directly. In other words, we were trying to create a present and future recognizing Rondo as a storied place, a place of relation relationality despite geographic dispersal and without requiring one to be a landowner to bind oneself to place. Rather, memory, archival objects, and story sharing were the connectors. So as part of this event, and here you can see the group photo, that's uh, the students from the U and the elders and me with much shorter hair, because it's been two years. Um, in the second conversation, uh, we had youth from a multiracial youth group who was formed by the Minnesota Historical Society choose some pictures from 1968 to bring to uh, and, and before some pictures that would reflect not just uh, white history of the Twin Cities, but also uh, Latinx and African American and Native American history. But we didn't know what photos they were actually going to bring. And so a few of these photos really sparked some synchronicity, some unexpected but resonant, surprising, not accidental, surprising conversations um, because of the connections that were made by our group, both the elders and the youth. So pictured there standing um, in front of the photos is Frank White, whose mother is Mexican-American and his father is African-American. And uh, one of the photos that was brought is actually a photo that includes two of his aunts and his mother. And like the photo of Gloria Massey's childhood that was just labeled Black Children and Rondo, this photo, which only has the caption from the Minnesota Historical Society associated with it at this point back in 2018, was just Mexican American women from the Cinco de Mayo parade. None of them are named. Right, so somehow the Minnesota Historical Society got these photos um, from somewhere, whether it was a church or an organization that didn't have the time and the resources to provide labels. And of course, the Historical Society didn't use its time and resources to ask or share resources to provide an opportunity to make these people named. So Frank goes over this photo and has tears in his eyes. And and he tells us that his family members are in this photo. And there were staff from the Minnesota Historical Society there who witnessed this and then of course asked him if he would be so gracious to share the names that he knew from his family. And so I also just want to emphasize how he talked about how it's very meaningful to him. My mom and three of her sisters have passed away so it makes me think maybe just about that. Like there's that photo of them when they were younger and they are still with us. So that spiritual connection to the memory he really invoked. Another couple of photos that were arrayed that aren't in the frame were of members of the American Indian Movement, a picture of Black Minnesotans who participated in the Freedom Rides, and a photo of the original Hallie Q. Brown gymnasium with folks playing sports. And these three photos came together in this interesting constellation to link indigenous struggle to black struggle and the memories of the elders remembering these struggles in the same moment. So Gail Foreman, one of the elders, uh, was looking at the picture of the gymnasium and she said it was just a wonderful memory to go back into a period of time when Hallie Q. Brown was our place. It really was. It was a place of comfort, fellowship. If that gymnasium was still around and could talk, my, 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 so that was. And then the wounded knee. Of course, we were all very tuned into the television watching what was going on with our brothers and sisters, our native brothers and sisters. And during this exchange, one of the students, Matthew, admitted that he had not known anything about either these photos or the things they referred to. And he said, I think the one with the Freedom Riders was interesting to me because just seeing a Midwestern connection to something happening in the South, it was just something I was questioning last week because it seemed people from the North were sort of removed from the civil rights movement as far as the way they portrayed it in school. Seeing the AIM movement started in Minneapolis, I didn't know that. 
and how so much has changed, but so much seems the same. Because if someone had showed me that photo and it wasn't black and white, I wouldn't question if it was from 1968 or 2018, really. In another exchange, these sort of cascading uh, memories and thinking about past and present and future all at the same time really started to flow. Um, Antoinette, who is the oldest of the elders who participated, um, had this beautiful quotation about relativity. Um, you will be able to share yourself with somebody to make them realize that there is strength and caring and love within your connections. We are all joined together and that's why we know love exists. It's all of our caring and connection with each other. And then Mahad, one of the students said, I realize that I'm now thinking in the next it made me start thinking about what my plans were going to be and whether I'm thinking about the now or the future. People would assume that we've never been at this point before, but it happened 50, 60 years ago and it's gonna keep happening. I lost my cursor. There we go. Um, so I want to end this section with another quotation from Gail Foreman. She's there pictured in the white shirt and hat with Miranda, one of the students who was at the event. Um, I think she speaks to the healing power of sharing memories of storied land and being together in place. Um, she was reflecting on how some of her friends wish they had not moved as far away as they had, even though really they didn't have much of a choice. And she said, I just want to tell them, come and be a part of this. Whatever time that was back there, I want to say 65 or 60. So that's what I would begin with there. Something, because you know, people would always say, Gail, are you still in the community? And I would tell them, yes, I am, where I've been all my life and where I'm going to be. And then they talk about, oh, I wish I would have stayed. That's what I would say about why they need to be part of our memory. So with this, Ms. Gale invites others, regardless of their proximity to the space of Rondo on the map, to become part of a greater Rondo memory. Because to share the memory is to be in relationship, to create a tie to place that is not dependent on property ownership or geolocation, but shared stories and connections between people, ways of relating. So what I think these experiences with our conversations demonstrate is ways to practice what Larson and Johnson refer to as being together in place. The resilient conversations and curated photos unsettle both the notion of settler time and ownership of place and space documents and photos. Linear time was unsettled by the understanding between youth and elders that though much had changed since 1968, so much of the struggle was still the same and so many of the memories were still in place. A very cyclical sense of time, a place-centered time. The link of fellowship, friendship, and care created between the students and the elders was just palpable. And though the college students were not from Rondo, you could argue they should have been, had it not been for ghetto colonialism. They would have been story sharers. They would have had opportunities to hear from these elders, opportunities that were erased initially by the coming of the highway. And so the relationships between elders and youth that would have happened in those maze ways we were able to restart and recreate by a story exchange, recovered archives, not by owning something. So I tend to agree with scholars like Tuck who argue that decolonization may be incommensurable with other forms of civil and human rights frameworks because it requires us to deal with storied land. Quote, solidarity requires us to deal with the incommensurability, not to try to escape to what we have in common, end quote. For example, when we think about Rondo or any other space in the United States um, in terms of black land, if we go back to the promise of 40 acres and a mule, we have to recognize that that promise 
of giving away land is part of settler logics that nullify indigenous claims to land. And we have to recognize that even as we understand simultaneously the need for formerly enslaved people to have a place to call home. But having space partitioned by settler understandings is violent and continues to normalize white settlerism. And ultimately, as the history of Black Wall Street and Rondo testify, Black property ownership is no protection against a white settler violent state. So how we tell a story matters. Where we say the story started influences what we believe about how far we have come, how far we have to go, and how close we are to the struggles of the past. Which struggles are part of our own path, our own maze way? So the curriculum we're building for the fourth and fifth graders is centered on the story of Hallie Q. Brown's namesake, how she visited the Rondo community during her lifetime, and how after that visit, the community struggled against the coming of the freeway. But we are going to start that story with that map that I showed you of the Dakota land understanding of the Twin Cities. And why do we need to do this? Because we cannot remedy one white supremacist erasure that is already premised on a prior white supremacist erasure. Because to heal the harms of ghetto colonialism, we need to go to the source, to the beginning, to go back to the future of constant cycles of violence, displacement, and cultural erasure. We need to recognize the multifaceted, complex relationships to land and place that coexist, even when we don't see them on the surface that has been scraped clear of its stories. When we consider there are multiple ways of coexisting, there are multiple stories in the landscape as living beings sharing space, co-occupying self-same land. I think we can start to see other ways of being, other options for sharing space, other ways of thinking about healing and reparation that aren't tied to individual compensation in a capitalist framework of ownership, value, and settler belonging. So the way we tell the story of Rondo matters. And each time I tell it, each time I interact with the space and I hear other stories, other whispers, other ghosts emerge to let me know that we haven't even scratched the surface. A reckoning about the disruption of Rondo must also include a reckoning with the disruption of Dakota land relations. And maybe that's a harder story to tell because it doesn't leave us with lots of easy positions to stand in, particularly if we insist on centering settler understandings of land ownership. Now there are some Rondo elders and descendants who do want reimbursement for their property value with interest and appreciation, thank you, um, for the properties that were bulldozed, removed, and snatched at artificially low prices set by a racist government. But I want to hold on to and emphasize, again, where we begin our story determines our vantage points, determines our calculation of who has lost something and our understanding of where the harm began. This then influences whose wounds we attend to and whose relationships to space and place are centered, whose claims are examined, considered, and honored in a reparations process. If we only look to the 20th century story of urban renewal and other mechanisms of displacement, we participate in the continued dismissal of indigenous claims, the continued erasure of relations to land that exists concurrently with the dominant public's understanding of land's purpose, role, and value. So I hope we can instead agree to sit with stories of land, to ride out the tensions, and navigate new stories and new relations. So though we are displaced, at Hallie Q. Brown Center, we're not nowhere either in time or in space. We are together in place, in the middle of something, in struggle, in solidarity, and in care, sharing st stories in the spirit of being together in place. Thank you.